Hello everyone, my name is Luigi. I will be working in this group with Andrea, Troy, James and Daniel. We will be discussing Rolex as a company and we will be paying particular attention to their flagship product, the Submariner. That will be followed by an overview of the marketing exploits of the company and that of its competition. Finally, we will be giving recommendations on how Rolex can progress in the future. Founded by Hans Wilsdorf and his brother-in-law Alfred Davison in London 1905, the company later moved to Switzerland in 1919. At first, the watches manufactured were sold to jewellers who independently branded the product themselves. However, in 1908, Rolex came up with the name Rolex, which they have used ever since. The company is still a privately owned business and no shares are exchanged on the stock exchange anywhere. In 1931, Rolex uh, invented and patented patented the first watch with a self-winding automatic mechanism with a perpetual motor and also in 1945 they had the first watch that displayed the date as well as the time. In 1953 Sir Edmund Hillary wore a Rolex when he reached the peak of Mount Everest. Also in 1953 the Submariner was introduced. This was the first watch specifically designed for divers and you can reach a depth of 100 metres and also its rotatable bees will allow for divers to record the, their immersion time underwater. In a 2014 survey by Global RepTrack, they decided upon the top 100 brands with the best reputation. Rolex was placed joint second behind only Google and Disney. The closest watch manufacturer was the Swatch Group, placed at 61. And a different list of manufacturers that only sell product, Rolex was placed first. In a different survey by Forbes, Rolex was ranked 57 in the most powerful brands in the world. Rolex itself is the largest single manufacturer of watches in the world, uh, selling over 2,000 watches a day with a revenue of estimated 7.4 billion US dollars in 2012. The company Rolex has many uh, strengths. Firstly, it is a strong worldwide brand reputation. It's seen not only as a way to show perceived wealth, but also as a gift to yourself. In terms of opportunities for Rolex, there are two main options available to them. Firstly, there is different markets to expand into, such as a focus on the female market, or to endeavour to go into emerging economies, such as India and China. Secondly, there is the option to have different product lines, such as leather goods, like wallets, or tie clips, and other accessories. In terms of threats, they are the same as in the weaknesses. There's the quality imitations, fierce competition, and also the fact that our watch is becoming obsolete with the advances in technology. Do you check your phone for the time before you check your watch? And now we'll take a look at some of the promotional activities that Rolex has undertaken as a company. We'll also analyze some of its strengths and weaknesses, as well as look at some specific examples. That will then be followed by my analysis of Rolex's competitors, specifically Omega. Taking a look at Rolex's promotional activities, we will show that they primarily utilize sponsorship and partnerships, celebrity endorsements, and print media. Rolex's promotional activities include the following touch points. Sponsorships and partnerships, brand ambassadors, social media, and importantly, print media. Rolex's use of sponsorships and partnerships stimulate awareness, liking, and conviction with the target audience. The weaknesses involved in using sponsorships and partnerships include a limited audience in comparison with that of television or print. However, sponsorships and partnerships are good at defending the market and creating additional triggers to stimulate brand recall. Rolex is involved in many sponsorships and partnerships. These include golf, such as the Masters Tournament, the U.S. Open, the U.S. Women's Open Championships, and the Riders' Cup, tennis, the Wimbledon, the Australian Open, Shanghai Rolex Masters, and the Monte Carlo Rolex Masters, exploration with the Rolex Deep Sea Challenge and the Under the Pole by Rolex, Yachting with the Rolex Sydney Hobart Yacht Race, the Maxi Yacht Rolex Cup, and the Rolex Swan Cup. Equestrianism with the Rolex Grand Slam of Show Jumping, 
the arts with the sponsorship of the Vienna Philharmonic Orchestra, the Salzburg Festival, and the Royal Opera House. Motorsports with its sponsorship of Formula One and the 24 Hours of Le Mans. Enterprise with awards going to work in exploration, working with endangered species, and health, where Rolex has created opportunities for mentorship in architecture, photography, music, theater, literature, and dance. Rolex also uses brand ambassadors, which are good for increasing awareness and liking. Weaknesses to using brand ambassadors include the fluctuating reputation of the ambassador reflecting on the brand, or a poor match between an ambassador and the brand distracting from the message. However, brand ambassadors are good for creating prestige for the brand, articulating the brand personality, and this is good for low-level involvement purchases. Golfing brand ambassadors have included Arnold Palmer and Jack Nicholas. Arts ambassadors have included Placido Domingo, Michael Bublé, and Yo-Yo Ma. James Cameron is one of Rolex's exploration brand ambassadors. For social media, Rolex's official brand channels are heavily product-centric. However, these are good for encouraging awareness, liking, and peer recommendations. Social media's weaknesses include not being able to control public opinion or user-generated content. And social media is not heavily used by all demographics. However, one of social media's strengths is the use of peer groups and opinion leaders, and this is important for younger demographics. It also opens a dialogue with consumers. On Facebook, Rolex has 3.9 million likes. On Pinterest, it has 3.9 thousand followers, and on YouTube, Rolex has 25,000 subscribers. Rolex makes heavy use of print media, which is good at encouraging awareness, liking, and conviction with the target audience. Print media faces the challenge of its ads not being as intrusive and being more easily ignorable than other types of advertisements such as television commercials, radio advertisements. Also. Print ads can appear in a cluttered environment, and they rely purely on visuals. However, strengths for print advertisements include effective targeting, and they are able to convey details and information, and rely on high-quality reproduction. All of this is good for high-involvement, low-elaboration purchases. Rolex's print advertisements heavily reflect their partnerships. Exploration, yachting, and diving are featured in these print advertisements. Taking a look at Rolex's promotional strategic approach. There are a number of key facts that Rolex conveys in its promotions. These are consistency, legacy, achievement, quality, precision, durability, toughness, exploration, and dependability. Also, when looking at Rolex's strategic approach, we will look at its use of design, semiotics, colors, typography, emotional appeal, and product placement. Use of design. Rolex has a heavy use of photos reflecting the sponsored events, featuring the ambassador and or the product, as well as text detailing a connection between the qualities of Rolex and the activity. Semiotics. Rolex uses the yellow crown and the seahorse in its promotional activities. Its colors are green and white and yellow. Typography. Rolex uses the Dido typeface. It is associated with fashion and luxury, and its letters are formed with architectural grandeur. The emotional appeal of Rolex's promotional activities involve adventure, achievement, and status. Finally, product placement is rare for Rolex, but it did receive credits in the James Bond movie Live and Let Die. In this section we will be analysing the promotional activities of Rolex's key competitors. Firstly, to do this, we need to outline who those competitors are. Within the luxury watch market, there are three key players, that's Rolex, Omega and Tag Heuer. Below that, there are a number of smaller watch producers such as Cartier, Longines and Breitling. As one of Rolex's key competitors, Omega, we will be analysing their promotional activity individually in order to gain a greater understanding as a whole 
of their promotional activities in order to evaluate them against that of Rolexes. First and foremost, Omega use print advertising. This is not uncommon with luxury watch brands as it allows the company to effectively target the elite expensive consumers which can afford these kind of watches. As you can see the designs aren't that peculiar to that of conventional watch advertisements. It consists of a very sophisticated classy individual such as George Clooney here and Daniel Craig also, also known as James Bond. The idea behind this is to instill the values of these classy, sophisticated men within the brand of Omega, as these values are considered intrinsic to the brand. An area of promotional activity where Omega differs from that of Rolex, Breitling and other luxury watch brands is product placement. Omega features in the hugely successful James Bond series, most recently with the film Skyfall. This was a 94 million pound blockbuster. You know, former SAS types with easy smiles and expensive watches. Rolex? Amiga. Beautiful. Having seen the clip, you can see the fairly blatant use of product placement in one of the more recent James Bond films. Ordinarily, product placement is an area which is quite difficult to display results. However, in this case, we have analyzed the the increase in Twitter mentions after the release of the film. As you can see by the, the bar of Omega, their volume went up by 20,000 upon the release, which shows a massive increase in interest and awareness of the brand as a result of this form of promotional activity. Furthermore, an advantage of using James Bond in particular is that he is a man associated with class, sophistication and excitement and therefore these values are imprinted onto the brand, making the watch itself more desirable. As you can see, Omega was the official timekeeper of the 2012 Olympics. This is a massive global event with a large audience, therefore an, a sizable reach and exceptionally diverse target audience. The advantage of using Omega's brand for something so important, so important as the Olympics is that it demonstrates the quality and reliability of the brand. When using timekeeping for something as crucial as world events within sporting, the clocks have to be perfect. And by using Omega, it shows the precision involved with their timepieces. However, this is an area where Rolex have also considered sponsoring such events as Formula One, which is incredibly precise. and. Um, the well-known tennis tournament Wimbledon. Therefore this is an area where I personally feel that Rolex is probably outperforming its competitors. As you can see Omega have a fairly impressive social media profile. As does Rolex, however there are some advantages to Omega's use of channels. Omega use a variety of channels whereas Rolex are slightly more close-minded, not opening themselves up to formats such as Twitter which is considered one of the most popular and largest audiences within social media. However, where Rolex excel and perhaps social media decline and Omega decline in social media is Facebook. Rolex has a 3.9 million likes whereas Omega only has 800,000. This is clearly an area which should be evaluated on the side of Omega but more importantly with regards to Rolex I feel that Twitter is an area which needs to be assessed. So now we are going to have a look to the consumer profile for Rolex. According to the magazine where Rolex advertises its product, most of its adverts they are actually aimed to uh, men, to be precise, 82%. The demographic age would be 40 plus. And uh, they would have uh, mainly a college degree. And uh, as employment status, they will either hold a, uh, a managerial job or a professional job. So these men, they have mainly a household income of 100,000 pounds. Also, 32% um, of them, they are married and 68% uh, are single. So now we are going to have a, a look to the uh, customer profile psychographics. 
59% of British consumers wear a watch. Uh, according to a Minter report, 17% of consumers would choose a brand based on their popularity and on their prestige. Consumers do not mind to pay um, an extra money uh, for something that it is exclusive. And also 24% would wear a different watch depending on a different occasion, such as wedding or casual wear. According to a Minter report, a Rolex consumer sustain a very healthy lifestyle. So the most practiced sports there will be tennis, cricket and horse riding. So now we are going to have a look to the luxury items among consumers. So humans, since history, they've always been chasing an um, oligarchy power. So um, they, in order to establish themselves on the social class, the uh, luxury um, concept developed. The concept of luxury is very different amongst population. For example, in the Indian culture, owning um, luxury items such as uh, gold and uh, me precious metal can, um, cannot be seen as luxury, but um, saving money and having cash, that is seen as uh, luxury. On this slide, we can see the top 10 countries where the luxury industry developed the most between 2012 and 2013. The biggest growth has been seen in Hong Kong between 2012 and 2013, and where the luxury industry actually increased by 10%. But other emerging economies, such as Russia and China, uh, are um, experiencing a growth in their industry. The biggest luxury economy, it is in the USA. Between 2012 and 2013, the economy growth by 4%. The luxury industry in the USA, it is worth $62 billion between 2012 and 2013. Hi, my name is Andrea and I will be talking about recommendations that me and the team came up in order to boost Rolex performance uh, both in an IMC integrated marketing campaign way and in an advertising way. So, Following a meeting that, were, that was taken quite, quite some time ago with my team, we have analyzed the situation for Rolex and we assessed the fact that Rolex is a really conservative company uh, with really strong values but really close-minded. They develop only one product line which consists of luxury watches and this product line is generating quite a lot of profit. As seen before in the video, that profit amounted at, at over 7 billion in 2012. Moreover, once the situation was analyzed, we have then tried to come up with ways in which the company could have targeted better, different and more uh, profitable targets of the, of the population and of the customers. The ways in which we have decided to do so is to develop an additional product line which, is consist, which consists of accessories such as pens and tie pins as well as leathery products such as watches and small bags. This would consist an attempt in an attempt of tar for targeting different target audiences such as lower income and social classes as well as females. The way in which lower income and social classes would, have, would be targeted are because these accessories would still keep up with the codes and conventions as well as the values and the material level which is used for the watches, however they would be sold for a much lower price. That's that in that way, when customers would walk into the Rolex store, they would not only see watches which they cannot afford, but also maybe accessories which still connote with brand with high values. In the way we would produce watch, uh, sorry, wallets and bags, we would try to make an attempt in order to address females which are more attracted to leather products such as wallets and still implying the general overlines and codes and connection, con uh, codes and cones and conventions of the brand. This is the way in which our team decided to tackle the the, the problem. We believe that this would follow the lines to which our competitors are operating now to cite 
a couple of examples. Cartier began as a jewelry producer, now moved into watches and also leather products. Also, Montblanc started producing pens and now then moved into producing jewels and now is producing also wallets and bags which are really successful. This we decided was an attempt of competitors working in different niche markets such as the jewelry, the watch producing and also the leather trying to merge and cross into different markets in order to boost their profits. This has resulted in those markets merging completely and creating a new luxury accessory market which is really profitable and at the same time is really wide and implies more companies operating within the same environment but these companies come from different backgrounds for example as the examples mentioned before but Rolex still yet has to move into that direction uh, we believe that even though the company values and uh, quality is high this procedure is required in order to keep up with the competition nowadays so I thank you for your attention and I'm now about to conclude the presentation we hope this presentation has been really useful and this video as well has been really useful and also we hope that the information provided has helped the watcher so you um, have a better understanding of Rolex uh, situation and also of Rolex operational ways. This presentation of talk has talked about uh, the strengths and weaknesses of the company, their present campaigns, as well as their present operational values and products. So we thank you very much for your attention and see you next episode.